Hey guys, what's up? It's Ripe again in today's video. An entitled family repeatedly trespassed and trashed my lake access property. They hosted a massive illegal party on my land and parked their cars illegally. I prepared some traps to make them regret what they did. Here is what happened. Let's dive right into the story. My name is Sam and this is my very own lakeside horror story. So for context, I used to live in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina as an investment banker before a series of good or lucky decisions changed my life and led to an early retirement. I left my home and moved to the remote countryside after absolutely falling in love with the house and its private lake. From here I often hosted parties on the lake over the summer months with visiting friends. What I did not account for so far in the wilderness though was to encounter any neighbors but surprisingly I did have a few. One family which will come up a lot here so I will just call them the Smiths, that was not their real name obviously, I first met them a few days after I moved in when they were randomly at my lake having a barbecue, a bit confused but I did not say anything at the time. Oh, and by the way guys, if you're wondering about the weird last name, because I don't think there are many Smith families in Bosnia, this story was submitted by a subscriber from Bosnia and he said he simply used that last name because Reddit is mainly American and the actual last name of the neighbors would be hard to pronounce. Anyway, I decided it would be a shame to try and keep the lake to myself so I let people use it if they did not break anything and took their trash away with them and the Smiths on the other hand often left piles of trash in their wake, sometimes even in the lake itself. Following on from a few bad incidents, I tried to talk to them about it as they were getting ready to go home after another busy day of polluting. When I pointed out what they had been doing, they waved it off, claiming it was not their responsibility because they did not own the lake and then they drove off without finishing our conversation and I knew at that point they could not be reasoned with. Their constant problems served to only remind me why I wanted to move out to the countryside and enjoy a quiet life. What should have been a friendly reminder of a closer community only added to a slowly growing frustration I struggled to keep bottled up. After a while it got too much and I found myself driving back to Sarajevo for a sudden weekend getaway. I received a text message late Saturday from a different neighbor asking me about the party I was having on the lake. After a confused phone call we came to the conclusion that my neighbors were behind it inviting a large group of people which would no doubt result in mountains of trash and devastation. And well, despite the bad news, I thanked them for letting me know and now soured by the news back home, my holidays stopped and my plan for revenge began. As I returned to my lakeside retreat, I saw their cars parked nearby and after some unpacking, I headed down there to meet them. The neighbors, as they always had been every time I saw them, were lounging around with some of the kids also splashing about in the lake. I maintained a friendly conversation as I peered around for signs of the party in the corners of my vision but I saw nothing out of the ordinary. Perhaps this time they did tidy up to hide it a little, I did not bring it up and they did not mention it either. I did say however that I wanted my lake to be made more public and accessible so I let them use it as often as they wished, which they were not so ecstatic about as I expected, perhaps because they already used the lake as if it was actually public. But to their credit they did feign surprise quite well and I to my own surprise get a thank you out of the wife whom from a number of previous encounters and observations I took to being the stern matriarch of the family. A few nights later I am disrupted from my TV time as something is forcefully thrown or shoved through my letterbox with the sounds of tires squealing into the distance as I move to investigate it. Resting on the doormat was an invitation to a big party the Smiths were planning to host for friends and family on the lake, glancing down I noted the date as well. Perfect, I thought to myself with a cunning smile, now I could put my next plan into action as I set to prepare for their arrival. As the promised day finally arrived, I practically jumped out of bed that morning, eager to get things underway. First I sent a text message to the Smiths to say I was feeling sick and did not want anyone else to catch it. Second I set out wooden planks and twigs in rows to simulate a parking area that the guests would hopefully use because under the spaces I had buried boards of nails to puncture their tires with. 
Hopefully their tires at least. If my plan goes terribly wrong and someone stood on it, I knew I would be the one in trouble instead. Luckily I can say my plan went off without a hitch. I sat by my upstairs window with a pair of binoculars and a bowl of chips as I watched a fleet of cars arrive at the lake, pulling into their assigned slots like perfectly planned puzzle pieces. If anyone had noticed as their car slowly dropped a few inches, no one gave any indication as they hauled kegs and crates over to a small picnic area set out for them. As the party got fully into swing, I waited ready to set up my third and final plan for total revenge. I was temporarily taken aback by my sheer maliciousness and calculating cold nature, but flashes of bad memories caused by the Smiths as well as a desolate lake in the very near future removed any doubts I had. As the party began to get quieter, I swung into action, grabbing a pile of crude homemade signs I quickly made my way over the lake and hammered them around the area in clear view of the car park. Just for added measure, I uncovered the nail boards as well so that it would look as if they had been visible the whole time as a warning they had ignored when they arrived. As I heard people beginning to make their exits from the party, I snuck away to resume watching them from my house instead. When I had gotten back, there was now a growing crowd of confused people looking between the large no trespassing signs that had seemed to ominously appear around them in their absence. Hurrying to leave, they did not even notice their flat tires until they started their cars, which only added to the chaos and confusion of their party. Not long after, I get a hurried knocking at the door from Karen Smith, half torn between panic and anger, she accused me of ruining her party and I replied that she was on private land and using a private lake, warning her that I would call the cops if she made that mistake again. The group outside shuffled back down the road to the nearest house. The next morning, a tow truck came and dragged each car away until it was empty and I was alone again, just me and my lake. I never did see these neighbors again and I am all the happier for it. And yeah, ripe stars, I would actually love to know what you think about this story. Do you think that OP was kind of a douchebag in this one or not? To be honest, at first I thought that this was exceptionally malicious considering that not only the Smiths got hurt but also some other people. But then, since this was a subscriber submitted story, I asked OP if he gave the Smiths any further warnings in regards to not polluting the lake etc. And he said he reminded them actually multiple times and they always said they don't really care about polluting the lake because they don't own it. And apparently the other people that usually hang out with them are also a big fan of that sentiment, meaning they always pollute the lake and don't give a crap about making it look tidy. Anyway, let's continue to the next one. This one is titled Parking Revenge for Real. So I live in a very large apartment complex, I believe there are around 900 apartments. The majority of parking spots are first come first serve, if you work odd hours or get home late, you will have to park near the mailboxes and walk to your apartment and it can be a pretty long walk, half a mile. When you sign the lease you get the option to pay extra and get an assigned parking spot. One bedroom apartments can have two paid spots and two bedroom apartments can have up to four. When I moved in we paid for two spots as I work a split shift so half the week I am not home until midnight and half the week I get home around 6.30. There are signs in front of each spot saying if you're not paying for said spot you will be towed. The spots are also numbered if it matters we had no issues for almost three years. However, during the pandemic I got a promotion and a company car. My roommate changed jobs also and they gave her a company car as her job has her driving to nearby states. As luck would have it, two spots directly next to the ones we already own came open so we purchased them so when you get a paid spot you have to provide proof of license registration and your plates. If anyone else parks in your spot you have to call and okay it. The maintenance staff are known to check cars randomly and the cop who lives on site likes to tag cars for towing. The residents have to call a dedicated number, leave the information and the apartments call the tow truck. So we have 4 spots and 4 cars, my roommate was going out of town and decided to get her personal vehicle worked on. So when she left town it meant two of our spots sat empty. Then someone tried to steal my car so I had to take it into the shop. So then my work vehicle is a very large SUV, so when we have spaces open, I park parallel in two of the spots since we pay for them. I came home from work, parked my SUV parallel and went to bed. I woke up, walked the dog and noticed someone had stuck a sticker saying to stop blocking two spots and there was a random car parked in the fourth spot. 
I personally don't mind if people accidentally park in our spots and I leave a note explaining the spot they are in is reserved along with the spots number 7, 8 and 9 and please don't park there again. Then went to work and the car was gone. Came home and the same car was in spot number 7. I parked next to them and once again explained that the spot is reserved and next time I will ask the apartment to tow them. Again, I went to work and came home and the same car was parked parallel in spots 8 and 9. So the way the spots are set up, every four spots have a concrete curb with grass on it. The way he parked his rear bumper was touching the concrete curb. I parked in my spot but as close to his car as I could. I don't use my passenger side door so I don't need access to it. I was off the next day and was supposed to get my daily driver out of the shop. I then get up around lunch and check outside and the car is still blocked. I once again tell them to not park in my spots. I then move my car over one spot so they can get out and get a ride to get my car. I go do some errands, get food, go see a movie etc. I get home around 11pm and the car is still parked in my spot. The letter I wrote was shredded and on the ground and on my work car was a letter telling me off as I don't deserve the spots. So here is my revenge. I parked my personal car where my work car was, right next to his and put an old trail camera on the pole near the spot. I had another 4 days until my roommate was home so for the next 3 days I did not move my car. On day 3 apparently they tried to call a tow truck to move my car. The tow truck pulled up, looked at the spots and then left. On day 4 I called the apartments and had him towed. I hope he did not need his car for 3 days. And yes, the car has not been in my spots since a few days. Edit, the trail camera was in case the person damaged my car in rage or being stupid. Also, the person who parked in my spot was driving a newer Honda. It was not overly expensive but definitely newer than my car. My work SUV is a 2022. In addition I want to explain how parking is since I have 4 cars. So the apartments are a series of giant U inlets with free parking along the inside of the U and paid spots along the walls. So paid spots are not bordering or taking front spots from those who cannot pay. The next one is titled Never mess with me or you will regret it. This tale was told to me as a warning when I started on my first post-college job. I am relating it exactly as it was told to me. This occurred in the early 80s so those of you who have grown up with the internet may not understand how we did things in the olden days. There were no smartphone apps to show queue codes for airline tickets. They were made out of paper with red carbon mess. Reservations were done by phone, it was primitive by today's standards. Players, names have been changed of course, Sandra, super sweet secretary loved by all, True, I worked with her, she was amazing, Fred, Sandra's boss and Tom the local VP. Also there was Big Shot, the incoming manager from back east and Al, the lead engineer on the team. This whole story occurred in Salt Lake City, which if you don't know family was a huge part of the culture. Even at work family matters took precedence and local management knew this and allowed for it. And well, Big Shot's office minions in another corporate location noticed some slight irregularities in time cards like days off without pre-approved vacation requests. So he got himself transferred to the Salt Lake City office to straighten things out. He was pushy and naturally he was quickly hated. Big Shot ended up as a middle manager between Tom at the top and Fred. One morning Sandra got a call from her daughter who was unexpectedly in town and wanted to have lunch. Naturally Fred and Tom gave her the okay. Big Shot did not like that though and although it wasn't explained why, maybe it was not by the book, maybe he was upset that Sandra went over his head. In any case, he decided to stick his nose in. But rather than just say no, he dropped the last minute urgent travel request on Sandra's desk and it had to be done because he expected to fly out that afternoon. Sandra was heartbroken that she wouldn't get to see her daughter but she had her work responsibilities stopping by to drop off some paperwork and Elle noticed that Sandra looked a little down. Which was a huge change from her normal chipper mood. He naturally asked why and Sandra explained. Elle told her, he had no authority by the way, to go have lunch and we will take care of it. Big Shot got his travel packet, got on the plane that afternoon and flew off to his meeting. That's when things started to go wrong. The rental car reservation was invalid and there were no cars available at any of the agencies. All had a hold on them pending confirmation from some clients. So Big Shot ended up getting a rent a wreck. For those too young or not in the US, there really was a discount auto rental agency by that name. Quality was not their number one concern. When Big Shot got to the hotel he found that his reservation was no good. 
he had to wait around until after the tentative reservations expired, which was after 6 pm. Getting suspicious, Big Shot looked at his tickets and found they were one way. He had no flight home. To say Big Shot was incensed was probably an understatement. The next morning, Tom flew in to join him and he gave Big Shot a packet that was marked extremely urgent that had been left on his desk with a note to take it to Big Shot. It was Big Shot's return ticket. On the way back, Big Shot detoured by the corporate head office and got a very senior executive to come with him because of some very serious personal problems. The next morning, Big Shot led the senior executive and Tom into a meeting with all of Fred's department and began publicly berating Sandra for incompetence and so on. When he got to the part about the tickets, Fred interrupted and told the senior executive that Sandra could not have done that, she was on a proof time off having lunch with her daughter. This raised the senior executive's eyebrows and got Big Shot even angrier. The senior executive said if Sarah did not mess up the tickets, then who did? Fred stepped forward and then L. And one by one, every single member of Fred's team stepped forward to take responsibility to protect Sandra from Big Shot's wrath. Tom and the senior executive knew instantly what happened. Everyone on Fred's team had burned up the phones making tentative reservations for rental cars and hotel rooms, leaving Big Shot stuck with a one-way ticket, worthless reservations and no alternatives. Within the hour, Big Shot's desk was empty and his badge had been turned in. It was never explained if Big Shot was fired or if he was just quickly relocated, the senior executive though stuck around to get to know the team. He was very impressed with how the whole team stuck together and protected their own. After he finished telling me the tale, the engineer said bluntly, Don't mess with Sarah. We love her and we will make you pay if you upset her. Message received loud and clear. As I worked with Fred's team, I got to understand why everyone loved Sandra. She was an absolute gem in the organization, efficient, super friendly, just an all-around wonderful person. Addendum, I appreciate all the kind words and awards. However, I want to clarify a point or two. Note, everything is from what I was told because I was not there, so I apologize for any possible incorrect inferences I have made from the tale. From what was said, Big Shot was not well liked, he had a strict by the book mentality and was a bully. Tom and Fred had told Sandra it was okay to take a long lunch with her daughter. Big Shot did not like that because it didn't meet the weak advance approval policy. Just a guess, but it's possible he got his panties in a bunch because the request went over his head too. He could not stop Sandra, but he could bully her and make her miss the lunch meeting because he did not like the informality of approval in the SLC branch. He might have intended to demonstrate that HE was Fred's superior and people needed to get his approval and possibly to instill a little fear. It did not work out so well for him. Addendum 2, some of the respondents apparently are not reading the comments so let me clarify for those who want to be a contrarian or a jackass. From the way I was told, the story Big Shot was not removed from his job for doing his job. Sandra had permission from Big Shot's boss and that's explained in several comments below. His job did not include authority to override his boss's decision, he was removed for trying to bully Sandra who she had permission. He was simply not doing his job. And yeah, ripe stars, please let me know in the comments what you think about this story. Do you think that Big Shot was unjustly fired? Let me know what you think in the comments. Either way, if you have enjoyed the stories, please don't forget to like the video and maybe even leave a comment to boost the algorithm. Thank you so much in advance, your support is very much appreciated.